I love small group process. <laughs> it's almost like every group has its own personality, the punctual ones, like, whoa, that wasn't four minutes. <laughs> And the other ones who, you know, just talk and like, what? Already? <laughs> what? <laughs> what is the church? We've been looking at that for four weeks now. What does it mean to be the church? To be a body of people mobilized by the very spirit of the God who created the heavens and the earth, who holds the stars together in his hands, who spills his love out just as the blood of Jesus came down the cross, who holds back nothing for us. What does it mean to be the church mobilized for action to make a difference in this world, in the here and now? We've gone through the different parts of this. That To be the church, it means to be a, a place of hospitality, radical hospitality, the kind of hospitality where God himself takes a, a towel, puts it over his arm, and begins to wash feet, just like a slave might do. A God who acts like a slave, who serves. What kind of crazy picture is that? That's a picture of our God. And it's a picture of who we are to be. Radical hospitality to wash the feet of those around us. Smelly, awful, dis disfigured sometimes, not a pleasant experience to act like servants, to act like slaves before people. And slaves don't choose who their masters are. And Jesus said, whoever you serve, the least of those, the very least of them that you consider small, you'll find Jesus there. You will find Jesus there in the feet, in the heart, in the life of the one that you serve. And that you find out who you are as an individual. And we find out who we are as a church when we serve, when we give our lives away. That's when it comes back to us full speed. Jesus said that over and over again. When you give your life away, it comes back to you. But if you hold on to your life and protect it and say, this is the way I'm going to do things, this is the way I'm going to flow, this is what the Bible says, and I'm just going to stick to that, and you justify all of your actions, but it's all about self-service, you lose your life. Jesus said you die. But when you die to him and for his kingdom, for a whole new different way of living, Stuff comes alive. I don't know how to explain it. We call it a mystery. You give your life away and it comes back to you tenfold, a hundredfold. Who knows? Hospitality brings us to that place on our knees as we're serving people, the very least of these, and we're serving Jesus himself. Who are the people in your life that needs, need hospitality? Who are the people on this island who need hospitality? who are broken and wondering what's, what's going on and, and confused and, and not, not sure of where their next step is going to be or where their next meal is going to be or who's going to pay the bills or all sorts of confusion in their lives. Spouses who are leaving them or kids who don't talk to them or, or just life is not working out for them. Who needs hospitality on this island? Who needs hospitality in this part of the world? Amen. And we are the ones to be Jesus' hands and feet, serving people. Not with expectations and, and, oh, well, maybe, I mean, we want people to come to a relationship with Jesus, but that's not the... That's not the motivation. We want people to understand things and fix their lives up and make a good choice once in a while. But that's not the motivation. It's like Mother Teresa, you know, that poem, have you ever seen it, where, you know, when people despitefully use you, spit on you, and, and talk about you, and are mean to you, and all this, love them anyway, she says. And that's how she lived. Didn't matter whether you were a leper or a millionaire. She treated you the same because she saw Jesus in the heart of every human being. And that's Jesus' hospitality living through. 
That's what we're called to as a church. Radical hospitality, no strings attached. The church called it agape love, unconditional love. No strings attached. And that the people that Jesus brings across your doorstep, the people that Jesus brings across your path daily are not there by accident. They're him in disguise. Jesus in disguise to see what you will do. Will you be the church? Or will you be protective and walk on the other side of the street? Jesus told the parable about that one. And we all have done that before. Radical hospitality. There's a oneness that Jesus gives to us as the church to express to the world. We sang a song about it. They'll know we are Christians by our what? What was that? It's not doctrine. It's not how right we are, how correct we are in life, how we can point a finger at someone and say, I'm sorry, you're in that condition. They'll know we are Christians by our love. By this, all the world will know, you're my followers, you're my disciples. And there is a a oneness. Jesus said in his famous Sermon on the Mount, he said, there's even a oneness with strangers. There's a oneness with your enemy. Really, Jesus? Get in the real world. There's a connection, a unity that God has given to you with all of creation. How will you manage that? How would you how will you manage the unity that God has given to you? That connection that's in our mission statement. Following Jesus' teachings and example. We connect with God, we connect with people. And we connect people with God. It's as simple as that. It's kindergarten stuff. But it's hard. (laughs) It's hard to do. Because it means we have to live a life that's different. (laughs) We have to be different people. We can't do the usual stuff. We've got to stop hating people and divorcing people and and putting people off to the sides and, and saying, here's my buddies and these are not my buddies. That we are to receive people, the flock, the sheep, the, the, the world that God has given us, as is. Come as you are. <laughs> Come as you are. And to receive that, or those people. And it's going to be hard because our stomachs are going to tighten up and we're going to have issues and emotional things and hurts and brokenness. And our ego will say, protect yourself at all costs. At all costs, protect yourself. And some of us will do that. And we do that. And we justify it. We take our Bibles and we justify it. And Jesus said, take your sword, you know, and it's right there in Scripture. And, and we're going to justify all this protection stuff as Jesus lays himself bare, vulnerable upon the cross for all creation, for all of eternity. And he is there, vulnerable, bleeding for us, and a God who does not protect himself. And we try to justify that junk as a church. And it's time to stop. If we're going to make a difference in this world, a world that desperately needs a word of hope, a word of encouragement, a word of healing, something that makes a difference. If we're not going to go down into the annals of history as simply a museum piece that had no effect upon what's going on in this world, we've got to live life differently. And we've got to take this unity stuff seriously. Paul did. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all and through all and in in all. God is the one who holds everything together. Let's live that way for a change. Oneness is not just some hippy-dippy thing that we kind of go, wow, put another flower in your hair, you know. It's, It's about something that God is actively doing. It's about a view of reality itself. How we see people, how we see life. Is there a connection or is everything all disjointed? Well, guess what? The world believes everything's disjointed and it's going to hell in a handbasket. But we get to live differently because we know the bigger story. Unity, oneness. And then I had to throw two Greek words at you. Sorry. (laughs) Metanoia. Some of you are annoyed at that. (laughs) 
metanoia. It's a word that's translated repent, but it's so much bigger than just a religious term. It meant, in the Greek world, it meant to change your thinking, to change your mind about things. It's widespread. And Jesus is the game changer. Once you've encountered who Jesus is, once you've tasted of that love, once you've experienced that forgiveness, that inclusiveness, that unprotectiveness, that amazingness and life in Jesus, everything changes. It's a game changer. And if you haven't experienced that, it's so simple. You simply say, sorry, Jesus, been living in the wrong kingdom. Because there's two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of our life and how we run our lives. And that can be individual or even institutional or even national. A self-serving, self-centered kind of life. And, and it can look good on the outside. I'm just making wise decisions. I'm just making, trying to do the best I can. Why are you getting down on me, Pastor Scott? Well, I'm trying, you know, I'm just trying to make an illustration here because we all live in this kingdom, the kingdom of this world. We're all there from time to time. Sometimes we spend more time there than others. Then Jesus talked about this other kingdom where God's in charge. And it's not this kind of the way human kings operate. It's the way that God operates. His whole power system is so different than ours. My ways are not your ways. Over and over again in the Bible. I'm not like you. Well, what do you like? Well, I'll send you my son. He'll show you what I'm like. And so Jesus lived a life, for, at least for three and a half years that we have record of, Jesus lived a life that was giving, totally self-giving to the least of these, to the people who were out on the edge of society. Nobody wanted them. Nobody cared for them. Nobody really loved them at all. And Jesus went to those guys purposely. He defiled himself according to the rules because the love of God cannot be held back. <laughs> and so... If we're going to live that Jesus way, it means taking all of our kind of little structured Christian whatever reality, our carefully constructed tinker toy kind of viewpoints of things, and taking it apart and saying, okay, God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? How do you want me to live? How can I live with a hospitality and a connection with Jesus that will blow people away by my service without coercion, without arm twisting, sometimes without words. How can I live with changed thinking? And when I come up against a problem, when I come up against a challenge, instead of reacting in my old ways, how can I act in a way that reflects you? something new. And it will feel weird when you start to do it. In fact, even humorous when you begin to act in some different ways when problems arise. But that's what we're called to do as the church, to change our thinking. I've had to change a lot of thinking in my <laughs> since seminary, believe me. <laughs> and being on this island for 10 years now, the Lord has brought me through a whole new thinking process and I'm really different than I was a year ago or three years ago or ten years ago. What's God doing in your life? Where is he inviting you to re-examine, to look at your life and your viewpoints and your attitudes in new ways? The final Greek word here, eoangelon, it sounds like evangelist or evangelism, which it, that's where the word comes from. But again, it's just like this is more than repent. This is more than evangelism. And sometimes that word has some funny overtones to it and we get nervous and don't make me do this. You know, I can't talk about Jesus or the Bible. No, evangelism or evangelon means good news, pure and simple. All it means is good news. And Jesus says, believe the good news. Well, what's the good news? We talked about that last time. The good news is that God loves you. I mean, put it into a real simple kind of, we, we had different responses, but summing it up, God loves you and wants you to live in his kingdom. 
Very simply, God loves you and wants you to live in his kingdom, in his realm. That's your choice. And to allow people their choices and to not get anxious about things that are going on and, and people going, oh, well, I, I guess we'll have to let Bill or so-and-so, you know, Jane, you know, live in their own place. But, boy, I really want them in the kingdom. Well, so does Jesus. But we can't force people into kingdom living. The only person you can make a choice for is yourself, whether you're going to live in this kingdom, this strange kingdom where Jesus is in charge. And he'll show you how to serve and be connected and have different kind of thinking. Because different thinking leads to different kinds of actions. Different kinds of actions lead to a different community. Different communities who are changed lead to different kinds of states. Different kinds of states lead to a larger country, an enlightened country. A country that lives by the principles and the life of Jesus can change the world. This is what one church can do, and you're invited to be part of that. Eu Angelon to be good news to people around you. Because so oftentimes, instead of joy and, and all those other wonderful gifts of the Spirit, we, we are not good news to people. I mean, I've had people tell me here on the island and in other places too, why would I go to church? Why would I waste a perfectly good Sunday morning? <laughs> in fact, I had a kid on my bus who, who said, oh, we're going we're gonna to come to church, you know. But, and then... She confessed, you know, she's one of the elementary school students. She confessed, she said, I'd really come to church, but, but it's just so hard to get up. She's not even a teenager yet, you know, I mean, <laughs> really? It's just so hard to get up. What if we had a kind of church that was so engaging, so much fun, but so challenging, and a place where you could learn and grow, where you can be accepted, where you can, everybody knows your name, uh, a place where you can come and grow into the fullness that God has for you in your own timing, in your own way, and people aren't criticizing you or judging you, but they're, they're supporting you and praying for you, and good things are happening. It's good news. Do you think she would come? Would she? Maybe. How about adults? 66% of Drummond Island are adults between the ages of 35 and 75. Two-thirds of residents here are adults between 35 and 75. We don't have a lot of millennials here. <laughs> Not a lot of young people either. They're just us old aging baby boomers. <laughs> Most of which who have been to either this church or the Catholic church in their lives. They've had exposure to some form of Christianity but they don't find it relevant now. What they find relevant is being with family. or I mean, they're not bad things. Being out in the wilderness, being out on Drummond, uh, fishing or trapping or hunting or, or swimming or something like that. Not bad things. But what if we were so magnetic, just like Jesus? He drew crowds from all over the place because people felt safe around him because he was good news to anybody. A pro you're a prostitute or a tax collector or, or a soldier or a rich person or a poor person, a leper. Didn't matter who you were. Somehow people felt safe around Jesus because he was good news. What if we could do that? What if we could actually pull that off and be known as good news? What if every church on this island could pull that off and be known as good news places where people, no matter what your religious belief or what your label was or whatever, that you would come and you would feel welcome and that it would be a safe place to grow. What if? And then we've got this whole thing about home. Just like in this song, What does it mean to come home in the best sense of the word? What does it mean to come home? Jesus told a story about a son who wanted to have his inheritance right away. He wanted the money now. Show me the money. And the father was pretty well off, had a lot of stuff. 
He said, okay. He granted the son his wish. Son took a bow load of money, a whole bunch of money, went off way far away into a land, into a culture that was totally different than anything he had ever known. And he spent it on every pleasure, everything that he could imagine he had money for. It was great. He partied day and night, had a great time until the money ran out. <laughs> and it always does. doesn't matter how much you have. It's always an end somewhere there. And he's feeding these pigs, right? You remember the story. He's feeding these pigs. For a Jewish person, I don't think that's a good place to be. You know? Stay away from the bacon. And he's feeding these pigs, and he's starving to death, and he goes, whoa, wait a minute. I don't have to do this. I could be a slave. I could be a servant in my dad's house. And I could still get, I could get at least three meals a day, even as a slave, even as a servant. So he makes a plan. He's thinking. And he has a speech all prepared. And he goes walking back to his father's house. Now one of the things we learned on Tuesday morning is that the father who's looking and sees his son far off, as it says in the Bible, far away. The father's looking and he sees this kid. He's barely can see him. There he is. He's, I, I recognize that walk because the father's been looking every day for this kid. And he sees him and he goes running after him. And one of the things we learned on Tuesday morning is that it's not just dad. I mean, this was, it's an amazing scene where this father picks up his robes and in the most unseemly, undignified way, he's running along with these robes flopping and everything and looking all crazy and undignified, but he doesn't care because he's consumed by the love he has for his son. And he's running like a fool to go meet this kid. But there's another reason, too. Because this kid who went off into Gentile territory, into pagan territory, and has soiled himself by spending all of his stuff, he's denied his heritage. He has said no to his people, and he has spit in the face of his God. The townspeople are also looking. They've got their eyes open, and they're going to come after this kid too. And if the townspeople get a hold of this kid, it's, it's, he's done. They drag him into town. They shame him. They excommunicate him from the community. And then they still make him serve as a slave for so many years. Even as kicked out to bear that shame to bear the heaviness and the guilt of what he's done, to really feel it. That's what the townspeople want. They want vengeance. And that's why the father is running like crazy to beat the town to his kid. Because he wants to beat the townspeople. And you know the story. He comes up and the kid gets part of his speech out part of his scheme, and the father doesn't even hear him. He wraps his arms around him, put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet, robe, kill the fatted calf, have a party, this whole crazy kind of exuberant, over-the-top love that God seems to have, that this father seems to have for this son. That's what I want us to be. I want us to be in that, that embrace of the Father. I want us to learn how to let the other stuff go by. All the hurt stuff, all our own brokenness, all that ego stuff that wants to just say, you know what, you deserve what you got. Because that's what those townspeople would have done to that kid. I want us to be in that embrace of that Father who looked day after day for his kid. And doesn't hear the schemes. Because people will come to church. People will do things. And it, I mean, we, I do. I mean, we do our little bargain thing with God. And, you know, we think that it's all spiritual. And, yeah, Jesus, we're tight, you know. And all this stuff. But God knows there's a lot of schemingness stuff in us. But God still loved Jacob. God still loved Abraham. God still loved Isaac. And all the rest of the characters in the Bible. In fact, Jesus still loved Judas. 
up to the very end. Notice what he calls him in the garden. Even as he's being kissed and betrayed, he calls him friend. I want to be like that. I want our church to reflect that each and every day. The things that cause growth in our lives are the things that God is behind, the changes, the transitions, the newness that God is calling us into. But it doesn't come without a price. Sue, could you show that, the growth? This idea, and thank you, Kirk, for this, healthy things grow. And then growing things change, if you follow the arrow there. Changing things creates stress. And stress in life, you know, you, you try to get a chick out of an egg too early, and it dies, right? Just trying to help. Things to be born need stress. You try to get a butterfly out of its chrysalis too early, can't get its wings out. It dies. Stress helps us. Good stress helps us to be able to change into the things that we need. Stress invites trust in God. When we throw our hands up and we go, what's going on? What's happening here? And God invites us. He says, just trust me. Step into my kingdom. Listen to the whisper of the king. There's an end. There's a solution. Just walk with me. Trusting God is a healthy thing, and healthy things grow. God is going to lead us as a church into some places that will feel pretty stressful. Not all stress is bad, okay? And we'll try some things out. Some things will work. Some things will fail. But the idea is, is to live out the life of Jesus in a whole new way where this island and people beyond this island will begin to take notice and they'll say something different is going on there. Maybe I'll go see. Maybe I'll bring a friend or two. Maybe other people may come. And maybe, just maybe, that little girl on my bus <laughs> will be able to wake up because it will be so much fun and so amazing to be there. And maybe it'll catch on. Maybe other churches will take the lead. Maybe they'll show us some things that we need to be about because that's how the body of Christ works. We learn from each other because it's not just about Lighthouse Church. It's about every church on this island. It's about the churches that are yet to be formed because God has unlimited resources and love for the people of this island and beyond. And there is a movement of the Holy Spirit that is happening today all over this planet where new things are happening. And we don't always understand what's happening and the ways that they're processing, but something new is going on on this planet today. And I want to be a part of it. And I want our church to be a part of it too. One of the, my first experiences of churches came four years before I made a commitment to Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Four years. I was a sophomore in high school. And one of my friends, she was kind of a Jesus freak. She was always talking about Jesus this and Jesus that. Always had her Bible with her. Uh, kind of religious, you know. But she, said, she invited me one time to go to this meeting of other Christians. And she said, it's not like church. She said, in fact, we're just, we're meeting in this, I forget, I'm trying to remember back, so long ago. Um, it felt like it was a warehouse or something like that. It was not a church. People were just all kind of sitting, oh, we were sitting on pillows. This is in the 60s, okay, so, you know, come on. <laughs> so, long hair, <laughs> the whole thing, flowers. But uh, we were sitting around, and I went, and, and I just witness these people and she said just just listen and I listened to people talk about what Jesus had done in their lives just ordinary people and one gal started just crying and she just she just said I don't know what's going on I don't know which way is up my life is such a mess and people gathered around her and they put their hands on her on her shoulders I mean, just like a response, just gathered around. And they just prayed for her. 
And I just, and I felt tears in my eyes coming up. And I thought, wow. And that was a seed planted that day. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be till four years later that I actually made a decision for the Lord. But a big seed was planted in my, my heart. There was a crack there someplace. And God put a seed in there. And it's because of that experience, I'm convinced, that the Lord was able to meet me four years later and I could hear his invitation to new life. You never know. So to be the church means to walk by faith that Jesus Christ will be living and scattering his seed, the word of God, here and there. Because we never know where that seed may fall and how it might grow up. Be the church. Let's be the church. Let's pray. Father God, this feels like a huge experiment. It takes me back to some of my biology and chemistry days. Um, not sure where the lab manual is <laughs> sometimes. Uh, we know it's the Bible, but, but in the particulars, Lord, we have to depend upon you. Help us, Lord Jesus Christ, to learn how to proclaim you with every molecule of our being, to learn how to live differently, and to follow in this amazing adventure you call life. Teach us, Lord, step by step how to do that. Teach us how to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week. God bless you. Be the church.